There's more value in the connections outside of these talks than actually listening to the talks themselves. Like uh, we've spoken to a lot of very experienced, very tenured people who have lots of, you know, great stories um, and mistakes that we can learn from so that we don't have to make them as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And to the people on the internet, internet land who's going to be watching this in the future, this is the, this is the Kronos APIs for heterogeneous genius compute and safety talk. I'm going to be talking about SICL and SICL SC, as well as about what in C++, ISO C++, that's going to be relevant to SICL that we're looking at. Okay. So just a quick introduction. I'm going to do the first part that gives you a kind of an overview about what SICL, what SICL is. And then Nevin's going to come up and talk about what C++ and SICL, how they intersect. And then Brina's going to come up and talk about where she is going with SICL safety critical. OK, so SICL is, I think, kind of, is probably now definitely mainstream and growing rapidly. So this is our time. Its success has been based on the fact that it's open source, open standard and supports both open and proprietary implementations. Now, an open source implementation without community, I think, is useless. So we have a conforming, we have a conformance test that allows companies now to play in the Kronos ecosystem um, that without revealing the IP, but we also strongly support open source, so much so that we have many of our developing features on public GitHub. If you're still wondering what SICO is, although I think most of you guys know, it's all about um, heterogeneous dispatch to accelerators, but built on top of ISO C++. So in that way, a lot of code just works, and you have a SQL um, um, device compiler, but also a front um, um, a host compiler that can be of any any compiler you're choosing. Okay, all right. Continuing on, we have always in SQL pride ourselves to parallel C++ industry initiatives. So. Throughout its back history, from earlier SQL, we've been we've been built, building on C plus plus fourteen, then SQL. Um, did I move the slides a little bit? Okay, we've been built up built based on C plus plus fourteen, seventeen, and twenty. SQL twenty twenty um, was released, but it was actually based on C plus plus seventeen. Okay, so yeah, I I got messed up, but the alignment of SQL twenty 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 was released in twenty twenty but it's based on C++ 17. We're hoping, <laughs> hoping that the next cycle will be released and it will be based on C++ 20. All right, continuing on, there, there are two major implementations of SICL right now. There is the, the Intel DP C++ that uses the LLVM Clang. It's part of one API. And then there's Hipsico, but whose name has just changed, as I'm, to, um, as I'm told, to Adaptive C++. Now, one of the beauty is about SICL is that it's capable to be ported very quickly to almost any kind of platforms with accelerators. Um, students have done it, researchers have done it, and it's quite usable very quickly. Now, there, and I can see, you can see that here in the, the experimental development that are here, a whole group of SICL that is either based on Vulkan, either based on the Huawei Baishan compiler, the Celerity SICL, which is basically like MPI, the tricycle from AMD for FPGAs. Um, motorcycle is a teaching tool from um, University of West Scotland. Um, there's Inteon's um, Polygeist NeoCycle from Japan and Samsung's processor in memory system that's based on that. That's kind of new. We have made headwave into moving sickle onto Compiler Explorer. This is a very exciting development for us. It's still kind of hiding under the C++ tag to do that. And you could easily access it using this this Godball command. And as one, and this this is just a simple um, 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 matrix, I guess. Um, vector, sorry, vector multiplication addition. And as as one somebody from mobile, I said, compiler explorer really is more fun than actual work. You can now also generate IRR, and this is all under the C++ tag, showing how similar this is to C++. And in future, I'm hoping that we will be launching a SQL project to enable us to be able to 
generate true Spear VIR. This is not Spear VIR, even though the triple, the triple tag looks like it says Spear V. Probably the biggest significant um, achievement of the last year was that we have, we have finally um, completed what's called the conformance test. Now, in C++, you're probably not that familiar with the idea of having conformance tests to the language. They do exist, but they had their so proprietary. Now, Sickle and the whole Kronos ecosystem requires this kind of conformance test. And the big thing about Sickle 2020 is that it supports things like unified share memory, parallel reductions, subgroup operations, and CPAD. And you can access this, the conformance test in this website, on, and as well as you can see all the different subparts that we're doing. So I highlighted the idea of um, unified share memory because I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to, you know, every talk I always want to talk one or two interesting features. This is a particularly interesting one because it gives Sickle uh, a fairly a, a certain capability. So one thing I want to step back and talk to you guys about is the fact that difference when you're doing accelerators, obviously. The big thing is there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of data movement between the host and the accelerator. How do you do it? This could really be the big bottleneck if you don't get it right. I was the CEO of OpenMP for about six years, and that and I can tell you that about 75% of the directives in there is about data allocation and data movement. So it turns out that there are really only two, generally about two ways. There might be more, but but most people breaks into these two camps. One is what's called implicit data movement, and this is what. Um, and this is actually not the common case. The more common case is actually explicit data movement. And that's what most other APIs do. OpenCL, CUDA, OpenMP. And now SQL 2020 also does it as well too. And this is a case where data is moved to the device using explicit copy APIs. And I give an example there using CUDA. The less common example actually is implicit data movement. And only about two APIs really do it that way, SQL and C++ AMP. C++ AMP did it first, and I showed the way C++ AMP does it here. And this is where the data is moved to the device implicitly, okay, using some sort of host device data structure or some sort of dependency, dependency that you tell it to. That's what SQL does here. Now, SQL started off with the idea of implicit data movement, and then after a while, it turned out that there was a lot of requests for explicit data movement so that you can port code from CUDA, code from OpenMP, and such. Now, explicit data movement means that you're much more pointer-like based. So this is what it is. It's called Unified Shared Memory in SQL 2020, and it provides an alternative pointer-based data management model to the buffer accessor model. The buffer accessor model is the implicit data movement part. Okay? So what this does is it means that unified virtual address space, you have pointer-based structures, you can do explicit memory uh, management, and you can do shared memory allocation. So what does it look like? Well, USM memory allocations basically returns pointers which are consistent between host application and kernel functions on a device. It just basically represents data between the host and device and doesn't require creating accessors. And the pointer-based API is very similar to C and C++ developers. The data is moved between the host and device in a span of bytes, and then the pointers within that region of memory can freely point to any other address in the region. So it's a lot easier to port existing C and C++ code to SQL. The memory is allocated and data is moved using explicit routine, so SQL runtime doesn't perform any data dependency analysis, unlike the implicit data movement, and dependence of, dependencies are basically managed uh, manually. So some platforms will support different variants of USMs where the memory allocations share the same memory region between the host and device, and then no explicit routines are required to move the data. Now, if you look at the overall picture, this is kind of what I break it up into. There's this idea of the explicit USM that's at the minimum of what you need, where you have consistent pointers, you have pointer-based structures, you have explicit data movement, but you don't have shared access, you don't have concurrent access, and you don't have system allocations. If you go further um, um, to the right, you have what's called restricted USM, which enables shared access. You have concurrent USM, which enables concurrent access, and you have system USM, system shared memory, where the system allocations and malloc and new can share the data, okay? Right now, SQL 2020 only enables explicit USM, but it will enable other ones as we go along. 
So this is important. When you're building performance portable software, we think that there are a couple of things to do. If you build starting from scratch, SQL is a good place to start. It's open, future-proof with no lock-in. If you're starting from C++, then it's easy to add SQL to existing C++ software. If you're starting from CUDA, you can port that to SQL. Um, if you're starting from another language, Spear V might be able to enable not just SQL, but also new languages as well. The SQL ecosystem is vast since I've taken, since I've, since I've been chair, although I'm not chair anymore. Um, Tom Deacon now is chair. And the, it spans um, various kinds of high performance workloads like Romax, um, supporting for AMD and one API. And across the bottom are all the SQL members. Now, some companies have joined. So, for, for example, Mobileye and, and CoPlay is now part of Intel, and, a, and Xilinx is now part of AMD. But we have gained a lot of members. Um, I also want to talk about the Unified Acceleration Foundation that was just started up about a week or two weeks ago. And the whole point of this is to build a multi-architecture, multi-vendor programming ecosystem um, for all the accelerators and unifying the heterogeneous compute ecosystems and open standards, focusing on AI, HPC, Edge, um, compute, and open source. Now, it already has a large number, it's, well, it's already got a lot of big members like, like um, Qualcomm and Google and a few others I don't remember right now, but it's certainly gaining um, a start. The role of the foundation is to host a specification that defines standard interfaces for programming with common opera operations needed by developers, to host code projects that can be used by software developers, build awareness, drive a roadmap for the specification and the projects, and building a broad set of contributions to the project. Okay, so what is it really? It really is a, basically a way to build a large ecosystem around, around the whole idea of open compute accelerators, whether they're computers for AI, or for, um, for graphics, okay? And the idea is that it, it, it democratizes by moving, by, by decentralizing the, 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 um, the ownership of it away from just any one company so that all companies can have a say. Part of the structure is that it has a steering committee, a special interest group, and a working, and working groups. The working group has the specifications and, is open to, and the open source side, as well as the special interest groups working on the AI, the image, hardware, language, and math side. I guess this is possibly you know, something that could benefit um, software developers and processors developers. For software developers, it's a single, single code base um, to manage, saves time to market, it saves money in the development process, and develop within, within the open standards for acceler accelerated computing. And it's a standards and industry-defined libraries. For the processor developers, it allows you to adopt to an open standard with existing open source implementations and it enables existing ecosystems of software and educational source resources and leveraging an existing testing and optimized tool chain. So SQL enables supercomputers. We already ha have talked about this in the past where SQL is now being used in, in quite a few US National Lab computers that have combinations of CPUs and different GPUs, starting with Argonne National Labs, where it's Intel uh, CPUs and GPUs, Oak Ridge, where they use AMD GPUs, and Perlmutter um, at Berkeley using NVIDIA GPUs. So in that way, it probably strikes you right away, hey, how is this one language able to do, to be able to be dispatched to all these GPUs? And this is exactly why the National Lab is interested in, so that they don't have to rewrite for every different kinds of GPUs. It is also being used in Europe right now, um, in Lumi, in some of their, their pre-exascale systems, in Lumi, um, in Leonardo in Italy, I think Lumi is Finland, right? Yeah, and then um, in Carolina, that's in Czech, Czech Republic, okay. Um, Part of this talk is also to diverge and show you where we're going with SICO. And chrono safety critical is one of the big things that's growing up. I'm not gonna go through this diagram, but suffice to say, chronos have had a lot of um, safety critical APIs, starting with OpenGL safety critical, to Vulkan safety critical, to OpenVX, 
And now in March 2022, Farina is going to come up and talk about the success of the new sickle safety critical group. For myself, I've been, I am also the chair of the sickle um, auto saw group within Kronos, where we're building a sickle demonstrator for automotive within the auto saw consortium. And the idea of this is a concept that enables parallel heterogeneous computing using standardized C++ APIs for solving issues of high performance computing. That's been going for about a year and a half now, and it's going really well. So I think with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, um, Nevin Lieber. All yours. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Nevin Lieber. I work at Argon, um, do C++, SQL, and Cocos. And I'm also on the C++ committee. I'm the vice chair of the Library of Evolution and Computer Incubator, and admin chair and like vice chair of the US part. So I spend a lot of time in the library. And so I'm gonna talk, you know, so I this back and talk a little bit about what the C++ committee has been doing, and then try to tie it a lot that into SQL and GPUs and stuff. And so, you know, committee is really, every person there wants a better language. Even if no two of us can agree on what that is. And that's, they're technical arguments, they're heated a lot of the time, but, and so, you know, it's not consensus by committee. It's, it is consensus by committee. It's not designed by committee, which is, we get accused of that a lot. And I don't speak for the committee. I mean, no one does. I mean, we take polls and they speak for the, you know, this is what the committee viewpoint is on something. So I was thinking long and hard, like, you know, what is my definition of safety? Because there's lots of them. So mine is really, you want to limit the accidental damage to a system caused by bug. And really here we're talking about, you know, language safety. Really. And we prefer, prefer prevention over detection because we, want, we don't want them at all, right? So we, if we can prevent them to compile time, you know, we're better off. And as part of this, you know, what is security? And to me, it's, it's there are deliberate attacks against these things. It's not just accidental problems. People are trying to break systems for whatever reasons. And you hear a lot like, you know, is this code safe? You know, is it secure? I say it's very hard to obtain it on the slide. I think it's impossible to obtain it. We, we don't even have great definitions for any of this stuff. Like the ones up there, you know, are, is there no accidental damage caused to a system by bugs? I don't know. But I think relative measures is more important. Is it safer? Are you, are you secure against a certain attack vector? It's hard to just talk about security without saying, here's, what I, some, here's the attack I'm trying to prevent. Like the example I gave Monday night, like you know, I worked um, at a trading firm a while ago. And we, didn't, you know, we don't use encryption because we have links from our trading firm to the exchange. Point-to-point -point links, they're physically protected. So you know, that's, you know, breaking into that is not the attack vector we're worried about. And it's not on the internet. Now, to me, safety is a trade-off, right? Sometimes you're trading off performance. Sometimes they're on the same side, but sometimes they're not. And the worst one is sometimes it's on the same side of practice, and sometimes it's not. It actually makes it harder to reason about code. And that's really hard for us to do, right? Because we, we all want correct code, right? That's the real goal, right? Correct code is perfectly safe, perfectly secure. I've not seen it, but I'm sure that, you know, I don't think it exists. And we're also concerned about recovery. Like, how do we get the system back into a known state, right? You can't just always terminate. I mean, that can get you back into a known state, right? but that may not be applicable, you know, if you're running, you know, a billion dollar system that has to be running all the time, it can't just stop. You know, if it's got a pacemaker, it can't just stop either, right? That would be bad. So one of the big pushes on the committee is to get rid of undefined behavior. And right now, you know, it's our only knob for the, you know, there be dragon, don't go there. And if you have code dependent on UB, it's always a bug. So you can have tools like sanitizers, right? No fault sanitizers that could detect this kind of bug. You know, static analyzers could, you know, detect that compile time to prevent it. And everything else we have is defined behavior. It's defined in some way. Now, of course, you know, codependent undefined behavior can also be a bug. But it's much harder to write tools because the tools can't tell the difference between were you intentionally doing it, you exploiting that, or you know, accidentally just 
happened to hit that corner case. And the example I like to give for that is wrapping integer math, right? If you have unsigned math or atomic math and um, C or C++, they wrap, it's using complement wrapping with respect to addition and subtraction, right? And hardware does this, right? This is a decision made, you know, back in the 70s. It's not UB, right? And it's a fairly reasonable definition that you just let it wrap. The problem is, and I, mean, I don't have an actual statistic, but most of the time that's a bug. I mean, I have an anecdote. A long time ago, I used to work on slot machines, and we had a field issue. And I, I thought, I was like, yeah, I think the time wraps somewhere. And I told my um, colleagues, hey, why don't you move the clock up by like 49.7 days, I think. They go, no, Nevin, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. They did it and triggered the bug again. They go, how did you figure that out? It's like, man, number of seconds in a 32-bit integer. <laughs> because it was not intentionally wrapping it, but, you know, it, it was an unsigned and it, no, one, you know, no one checked it ahead of time. So, again, remember, this is not undefined behavior. This is very well-defined behavior. It's just hard to reason about because it's not what most people intend most of the time. So the committee's been doing this for a very long time, even much longer than this. I just wanted to pick up because this one shows up um, when we talk about safety in committee meetings a lot. So Array used the precursor to SPAN and MD-SPAN. And in, the, in that the first version of the paper, right, there's the sentence that says, any failure to meet a rabies bound safety constraints will result in the call to terminate, fast fail approach to safety. This is a critical aspect of a rabies design. It allows users to rely on the guarantee that as long as the sequence is accessed via a correctly initialized review, then its bounds cannot be overrun. And we didn't in span ship that. So is this safe? Again. Safer, perhaps. Safe, no, again, that safe's an absolute measure. You're not getting there. And the problem is, like, correctly initialized array view is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. Because you can't, that's the part you can't check. I mean, there's certain easy cases, like, you know, plus you have no pointer value that you can check. But in general, you can't check to see if the pointer or the range is valid. So let's move forward to, you know, more modern times. Uh, I think this is a Bjarna paper. Brendan and Gabby, you know, and, you know, trying to, you know, start talking about safe C++, right? It's easy to break the type system, there's safety violations, right? And maybe we get static guarantees based on the core guidelines with static analyzers. And starting to make rules to make things, you know, more feasible. So, Kona last year, we had an evening session on the future of C++ and talked about safety. There were lots of opinions. I mean, from, you know, up to and including carbon footprint. I mean, everything you can think of. And people started trying to bring, I said we don't design by committee. Well, occasionally it does try to sneak in. Right, UB and ambiguous behavior and GC and race conditions. But we really weren't identifying, you know, any, like root problems. Just kind of like, oh, I see this little thing I don't like. We should change it. And if I use the word safe, maybe people will take it more seriously. But not much in the way of principles. The one thing that really came out of that, though, is we did form um, a study group for this, um, SG23, Safety and Security. Then the direction group, Michael's one of the people on it, Bjarna and a few others, right? They come out with an opinion piece. So the direction group kind of says, like, here's what you guys really should be focusing on. They don't, like, it's not really like, hard technical things, but it's just like, this is what we should be concentrating on for the next releases. And like, they, you know, good set of things here, right? You know. Don't radically break backwards compatibility. You know, still allow distractions. Like, don't leave it just a safe subset, et cetera. And this is where um, Bjarna first talked about profiles. I'm not gonna repeat it. He far, it's his stuff. He did a far better job than I could do. So now comes like things coming in the library. And you know, in 23 we got MD span, right? A non-only multi-dimensional array view. And, you know, it's, it's good, right? It, it's better APIs help, right? It, you know, it strikes away tricky arithmetic. People get those, you know, array calculations wrong. It's annoying. And it's more declarative, right? Because you have template parameters can collect, you know, layout and access, right? And if you want, you can create an access policy that does bounds checking. 
but it still suffers. It still has to be initialized correctly, like like everything else in C++. And we're also working on um, the owning version of that, MD Array. It's actually going to be an adaptive around other containers. And but like newer stuff, like so someone's doing um, span dot add, like adding at to span because it's not there. Like containers all have at, which does has no preconditions. You can call it, and if it's outside, if it's more than the number of elements, it throws. And one of the motivations, major motivations in that paper, is this, right? The new method is safe in the sense that it is defined behavior instead of undefined behavior. Further, the defined behavior is one that can be caught in the code by catching the exception. Is this safe? I mean, you know where I'm going, right? <laughs> if you can get people to call at, sure. But again, it still suffers like, you know, is the span correctly initialized? And worse, it still may not detect a bug, right? People could be calling legitimately to do range checking because it's a function with no preconditions. It's not a, you know, no one is detecting a bug unless you intend it to be intending, detecting a bug. And throwing doesn't fix the problem, right? You've detected a bug, which means some, your program is in some state that you did not account for. Just enrolling the stack doesn't fix that magically. You have no idea. And as far as like, you know, Sickle's concerned, we can't even use this because we don't have exceptions on our device. So this doesn't like help us at all. Now the same author has like nine papers, like the first five have been, um, the committee said it doesn't want, like the seventh one there, the committee says he doesn't want, he's still doing revisions. Um, you know, just, again, personal opinion, not speaking for the committee, don't flood the committee with a bunch of papers. That, that are weak, you know, come up with strong, you know, a stronger, one stronger paper is much better than, you know, a bunch. So I will talk about the two he hasn't, have not actually been discussed yet. Shadowing is good for safety, and this is roughly, you can say, I, let's say you have a range base four, like for I colon V, then you can say inside that scope, V is no longer accessible as a name. That kind of thing. And a bunch of cases for that. And again, this is all in the state of the umbrella. As a library guy, I'm very glad evolution has to look at it first. I, I don't think it buys much because you're saving someone who can already edit the file, so they can just change the stuff. And then he's got another one, safer range access, right? Because operators square bracket front and back don't check. They're not required to check for out of range errors, right? It's just undefined behavior. And then he goes on saying, you know, they all return references that can lead to dangling and reference validation. So he has a bunch of functions that can return things and optional getters and setters. I mean, again, with my library hat on, I don't think that works in general in C++. I mean, what if you have a move only type in a vector? Like, how do you return it? That means you've taken it out of the vector, but you haven't changed the slot in the vector. It's still there. If it's a deck or a list, you can store non-movable types in those. So what happens? How do you put that thing in an optional, right? You can have a deck of mutex. So I don't think this is gonna go anywhere, personally. So there's really not much in you know, the library front. The language front in C++ is doing better. So this is a paper by J.F. Estine, the chair of EWG, of Evolution. And it's, let's initialize all the stack variables, including uninitialized number variables, with zero. So now it's well-defined behavior. It's not undefined to read those values. Now, of course, as I said before, once you have well-defined behavior, developers may be relying on it. They may be intentionally using it. They may be accidentally using it, thinking it's a bug, because you don't know their intention. And like, worse, a compiling, conforming compiler can't diagnose anything. It doesn't, because it can't tell the difference. And in part of the paper, this, this paper was good. It had, a, you know, it had actual measurements in it. Right. A lot of times people come to the committee with a paper and they say, hey, it's got better performance and there are no numbers. Like if you're not measuring it, you know, you can't just reason about performance. You have to actually show that you can act good, good numbers. And what we don't know, because the measurements were all done on CPUs, what kind of hit is this going to have on GPUs? I really don't know the answer to that question. So after that paper, uh, Thomas Kopp came up with um, erroneous behavior. So which says, reading 
An uninitialized variable is erroneous. However, it will still be initialized, um, still debating what value. So you can read it legally, but you can have, expecting to have compiler modes that says, you can check for this thing. But it's making it still all well-defined behavior. So stack variables are fully initialized, et cetera. And along with that, they're trying to make more things run in this behavior, kind of give up some principles and rules for it. So like this one that says like, if you have a missing return in an assignment, it'll just add an implicit return star this. And if you're in that mode that checks for erroneous behavior, then it can tell you, hey, you've got a bug here. I'm not sure why compilers just don't tell me that anyway. If I'm missing a return statement, that always seems bad. But I'm a library guy. And the thing I'm most excited about is contracts. And what contracts are, they're language support for checking preconditions, postconditions, and assertions. So finally, you know, we get more knobs for dealing with uh, library undefined behavior. So it, the standard's kind of weird. It doesn't differentiate between language undefined behavior and library undefined behavior, except where it does. Like, constexpr is not supposed to compile any program with undefined behavior. But they really mean language undefined behavior in that case. It's not checking preconditions on like, any of the standard library types. And so this gives us more knobs and principles, and which is what we really need. There's um, contract checking annotations and like kind of three modes, like ignore it means you don't check, just go because maybe you need it for performance. You know, enforce, which means it will terminate it. And observe, which continues execution. It's still UB if it, you know, if it detects a problem. It's still UB afterwards, but it keeps going because you may be on a system, you may be testing, you may be on a big system where you can't just shut it down, but at least you know, you can at least know there's a problem and figure out how to deal with it. So now we kind of get to sickle. So these discussions are kind of affecting the, our decisions in sickle. So a question came up with sickle malloc. So if you look at C's malloc in C++, if you heard it, right, it either returns a null pointer value or returns an allocated non-dereferenceable pointer. And if it returns a null pointer value, you can call free on it. You can call free on zero. That's allowed. But if it allocates, you're required to call free on it or you have memory leak. So the question comes up, you know, which behavior is safer? And we decided the expectations of C is better. Not all of us decided that, right? You know, that's the consensus we came to. But you know, the other one was, you know, reasonable that you could pick any of these, right? You know, it can allocate, right? It could not allocate. It could throw, right? Could, there's lots of behaviors you can pick. But we figured, you know, the least amount of surprise, even though the C one is, it's not great. It's kind of that way for historical reasons. Um, when I was a young engineer, I kind of followed the, C, the original C standardization effort. And no one was sure they were going to adopt C, like the vendors would adopt it. And some people, you know, the malloc zero return null, other people it actually allocated. You had to make both those camps happy, so we got implementation defined behavior out of it. You know, it's kind of the same reason we have three care types, because care on some systems was unsigned, care on other systems was signed, they couldn't come together without, you know, making half the people involved saying, we're not going to use this, so we have three. Now, something I worked on um, from um, Thomas Applincourt at Argonne is we're adding complex number support to Sickle. And again, it's, you know, like the standard complex, right, initializes numbers when well constructed, so no UB that way. We still have an open question to we had a method for uninitialized complex numbers. Because in some circumstances that will give us better performance, but again, it's, it's always performance versus safety trade-off, and there are in opposite places in this one. So as part of this, um, we wanted to present it at SickleCon. So we wrote a paper, submitted the paper, and in that side of that paper, we kind of said something equivalent to this, right? You can just reinterpret cast standard complex you know, single complex and the standard complex, and they're, again, they're two different types. And the sentence is in the paper, like, you know, this works because both types have the same in-memory layout. That's wrong. It's undefined behavior to do that. Right? It's, 
We tell people not to do that anyway, but you know, that whole state's like, you could, but you shouldn't. No, it's just wrong. Right. And here's kind of the rules for like type hunting. And really, what people see is there is special dispensation in the standard, so you can type hunt between standard complex and a two dimensional array. And that's to support C's underscore complex. Right? There's kind of where the rules are. You know, why doesn't this work? Because um, if you have like a long and a long, long, and they're, um, you do a reinterpret cast between them, and you run, you know, a compiler, what do you get? Well, if I have 0, my output is double zero. And if I rash 01 or higher, my output is 01. The same thing happened with GCC, it's not just clang. So it's undefined behavior, right? Anything can happen. I mean, you can predict what re reasonable things will happen, but anything can happen. And again, right, long and long, they're exactly the same size. They look like you should be able to just type one between them. There's, why wouldn't you? And so as part of this paper, we looked at other things, other systems. And there's a numeric code on VNG tensor. And they required a reinterpret cast from plus complex to um, C's com underscore complex. And again, that's undefined behavior. So this is, it's hard for people to get this stuff right. You know, it's, it's everywhere. And kind of the last thing I'm going to talk about is right now, this is an issue going in the single committee right now. And they give you the one minute explanation of how this works. So a single buffer is a sometimes owning collection of data. Sometimes it's like a, you know, an, a span or an MD span kind of thing. And sometimes it's like a vector, right? An accessor is a non-owning view that defines the data dependencies, and as Michael said, right, so for implicit data movement. And we kind of have these, when should the, buffer should the buffer destructor block? And so right now, the standard kind of says, right, basic rule, if there's some data to write back, because you're moving between the host and device, but it's ambiguous, so, and there's some kind of problems. So if you look here, right, Submits so an async action, right? You're gonna set something off to go be done on devices. So what happens in this code, right? Um, the accessor A gets copied into the lambda, gets dispatched off to parallel four. Of course, that whole thing just kind of, you know, the whole submit kind of returns, the parallel four returns. Buffer goes out of scope. The accessor is not out of scope. It's dangling and undefined behavior. And if you just move the buffer outside of the whole thing, it's, it's still, again, it's asynchronous. You don't, you know, you have it anywhere here, like, you know, waiting to see when it finishes. So, same problem. And worse, again, I said it was a sometimes only. So now, oh, I'm gonna have a buffer around some other host data. We're not sure, we're really, we're trying to define what should the right behavior be for this, because the cycle spec, which we're writing, isn't clear. And what's the safer solution? We're, we're just having very heated debates on this. You know, if you keep accessors and buffers just think they don't know very much about each other, right? It's simpler semantics that are easier to reason about, but can lead to more undefined behavior. Or you can tie them together. You can, you know, put like a shared pointer underneath the accessor to the buffer so it keeps it alive. And that does just work in more circumstances. But for us humans, it's harder to figure out what those circumstances are because you're not the one who implemented it. The person who implemented it knows. Everyone else, it's hard to say in English and it's hard for humans to figure that out. So the committees are made up of C++ and SQL experts, but on the whole, we're not safety experts. I mean, there's, sure, there's definitely safety expertise on the committee, but as a whole, we're not safety experts. And that shows, like, Many of the proposed solutions are added just ad hoc ones, like you know, kind of whack-a-mole thing. We desperately need more principles. Right? Bjarne is trying to put them in. Some proposals, like contracts, are trying to put them in. We need much, much more of that. And for SQL, it turns out like some subset of the customers have even more critical requirements. And so there's a separate group under Kronos, SQL SC, the Old Safety Critical System. And, and their focus is, to, you know, they have the signal expertise, the safety expertise, and the principles to apply for those customers that are, have much more stringent. And with that,
Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Verena, uh, and I have a background in um, software engineering, uh, focusing on um, compilers for many years. But these days, I'm the VP of Safety Engineering at Codeplay, uh, and I'm also the chair of the SQL SC working group in Kronos. So SQL SC is a, a new standard that's based on SQL, um, but the SC in the name specifies that it's specifically for safety critical use cases. So we say a system is safety critical um, if a failure of the system could result in actual harm or even death of people. And we sometimes also talk about safety critical industries, and these are the industries that develop safety critical systems. And they include automotive and avionics, but also medical, rail, atomic, for example. And in those industries, um, those systems tend to be certified according to safety um, standards. For example, in automotive, we've got ISO 26262, in avionics, DO 178C, and in medical, IEC 62304. And each of these standards defines um, a range of safety levels, and a system gets assigned a safety level depending on how bad the consequences would be should that system fail. And of course, the higher the safety level, the more effort you have to put into developing your system. And what these standards tell us is how to achieve functional safety. And functional safety is that the system functions correctly. So even if part of the system um, could encounter an error, the system as a whole will continue to function in some way. Um, or at least that um, you have minimized, you've done the best you could to minimize the risk that this system malfunctions. And that means that the risk has been analyzed, it has been mitigated to a reasonable level, and then you have proven that you've done all that you could reasonably be expected to do. So what do these standards tell us about how to achieve functional safety? Well, for software specifically, you're gonna to have to develop your system, uh, your, your application, according to some very well-defined processes. So there are processes for defining your requirements and for tracking them to your code and to your tests. There are processes for designing your architecture and your units. And there are processes for doing formalized code review and failure analysis. And of course, we want to avoid putting bugs into our software. And the way you can do that is you can avoid error-prone features. You should be adhering to coding guidelines and best practice because they really collect our collective expertise about how to write good and therefore bug-free code. And of course, the standards have a lot to say about um, how to do testing, and it will always involve coverage testing as a way of ensuring that you've written enough tests. But um, in safety critical systems, it's also important because bugs will always remain, right? And it's important that they are handled gracefully. So the system as a whole will continue to function even if there is a bug. But in safety critical systems, there's also um, added real-time requirements. So it's not sufficient that your code produces the right, the correct result. It also has to provide the correct result on time, and it has to do that every time. So it has to have a deterministic timing. And it's not just your function that has to be deterministic, but also your error management. So since this is a C++ conference, which of these can we address on a language level? Well, we can clearly do some work on the error-prone features, right? And that's where all the um, memory safety features and uh, type safety features come in. But we also need to tackle the deterministic timing at a language level. Because if you need deterministic timing, there are some C++ features that you just cannot use. For example, exceptions are TTI and dynamic memory. So functional safety is the type of safety. There are others. Language, what I call language safety, what Biana would call type and resource safety, perhaps, is another type of safety. And they definitely overlap, but there's a lot more to functional safety than just the safety of the language. So what can we do on an API level to make it easier to achieve functional safety? Because the safety critical industries are looking more and more towards C++ and towards SQL as a way of accelerating C++. Because guess what? There's an AI boom going on, and the safety critical industries want a piece of it. And it turns out that if you want to implement uh, autonomous behavior, then AI is really your only way. 
But AI algorithms are really complex. So you need high level abstractions to develop them. And um, they also require a lot of compute power. And if you want your compute power to still fit in your car or in your aircraft, then heterogeneous um, hardware is really the only way. So the safety critical industries are uh, looking more and more towards SICL as a way of um, programming these heterogeneous systems in a portable way. So SICL SC is based on SICL 2020, but there, are, there will be uh, modifications to make it easier to safety certify both an implementation of the standard and also the SICL applications that will be written. So on the right, you can see um, the three main aims of SICL SC. So it, compared to SICL, it will be simplified. So the runtime can be more easily certified. It will be robust, which includes comprehensive error handling, removal of ambiguity, clarification of undefined behavior, and it should be deterministic. So if you use the API, you can achieve predictable uh, results as well as predictable execution time. But why would the safety critical industries use C++ to begin with? Because SQL is very much based on C++. Well, C++ is constantly adding features that help, and Nevin gave us an overview of a few of those. But anyway, the safety features in the language are really only one concern, and there's definitely many others. To achieve productivity, you need development tools. To prove the correctness and the timing of your code, and therefore the safety of it, you need analysis tools, and that includes both static analysis as well as runtime analysis, like performance analysis. To achieve performance so that you get the output, the result of your computation within the deadline, you need optimized libraries. And to have confidence in your software and your compiler, you rely on the language maturity. And to be able to write robust code, you need guidelines. And through all that, you need experienced developers who have learned through hard graft how to write good code and therefore bug-free code. So the C++ ecosystem is very attractive to the safety critical industries. And it is the reason why, for now at least, they will make do with the limited safety features of the language. So the safety, uh, the SICL SC working group was only created in March this year, so we've only just started um, designing. But um, here are some of the topics that we will be addressing. So SICL is very, tends to be very close to the very latest uh, C++, but in the the safety critical industries are much more cautious at uh, adopting new technology. For them to um, use a, a language, they need certified tools to be available, particularly compilers, and they also need guidelines to be available. Uh, luckily, MISRA is releasing the new C++ guidelines um, very soon, I'm told, and that will cover up to C++ 17, which is what SQL 2020 is based on. Then there's exception handling. <clears throat> the timing of it is just not predictable, at least in the way, the way it's implemented in the standard compilers today. Unfortunately, SQL error handling relies on, SQL, uh, on exceptions. So that's something we're gonna have to change. Dynamic memory allocation is another thing that's not predictable. Both finding a chunk of memory um, could take a non-deterministic amount of time, and it will involve a system call, which is also unpredictable. And of course, success is not guaranteed. So you might have sufficient memory, but you can't allocate it due to fragmentation. And then uh, Michael spoke a little bit, uh, Michael and Nevin, uh, about buffer accessor and USM. So buffer accessor has uh, the possibility of giving you a level of memory safety, but USM on the other hand gives you more control over when your memory is accessed. And both of these are very important for safety, for functional safety. And of course, the standard library relies on both exception handling and dynamic memory, and SQL relies on the standard library. So the SQL SC working group wasted no time, and we started discussing the topic that we thought was gonna be the biggest, uh, which is dynamic memory. Um, but before we could design a solution, we had to first get our heads around what the actual problem was. So I'll take you through a little bit of our thought processes and, and the um, realizations that we came to along the way. So first we thought, okay, what does this mean? It means that 
we cannot have dynamic memory allocate, allocation in the application. But wait, right? That means that you need to know all of your memory at compile time. That that is pretty restrictive, right? And it turns out that an application is likely to have an initialization phase ahead of the steady state. And in that initialization phase, it is actually perfectly okay to allocate dynamic memory. So all we thought all object allocations therefore need to be known ahead of time. But wait, does that mean we're not allowed to use control flow? Okay, well, it turns out you don't need to know every single object allocation. You just need to know the upper bound, so the worst case of all, all the memory that you need to allocate. And what does the initialization phase look like? Um, do all the heap objects need to be allocated, therefore, in the initialization phase? Well, you don't actually need to allocate all the objects. You just need to allocate the memory. So you can allocate pools at initialization time, and then within the steady state, you can object, uh, allocate objects from those pools, and you can also put objects or memory back into those pools as much as you like. But where actually is the dynamic memory? What we're told is get rid of new and delete, right? So here's a very simple SICO application. Well, the, the objects are all on the stack, right? We're done. Oh, wait, okay. If you read the spec, <clears throat> the SQL spec, you come across this paragraph on uh, common reference semantics. And that describes the behavior of accessor, accessors and buffers and some other classes too. And what it says basically is that if you make a copy of an instance, then the copy behaves exactly the same as if it was that instance. So it's basically behavior like a shared pointer. And that means that uh, these objects will likely be allocated on the heap by the sickle runtime. So here is your dynamic memory. It turns out even if your sickle application looks like it doesn't allocate any dynamic memory, the spec forces or encourages the runtime to allocate this memory on the heap. So there could be dynamic memory in the application and in the runtime, and the, the, the dynamic memory in the runtime is a lot harder to find. So it is now the job of the Sickle SC working group to work out how can we modify the API to allow the implementation to avoid dynamic memory, at least in the steady state. So that's all I have time for today, I'm afraid, but I hope I gave you a bit of an overview of the kind of challenges that we get to look at in the SQL SE working group. And if you're interested, um, come and find me uh, and get involved. So uh, some closing words. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to strive for is to have, you know, um, have SQL become mainstream. But I kind of drew on that experience from my OpenMP days where I realized that programming models have to persist. But it also has to be have, have to have high quality and be portable. And the reason is workloads tend to persist for 10, 20, dec for decades. But the hardware changes really fast and no one really wants to keep rewriting things over and over again. And that principle is something that we're going to try to follow for SICO, SICO SC. So SICO SC Working Group started, and there are already more automotive and space agency companies that's involved in it. Um, we hope that with SICO SC, it will take SICO to another dimension. In addition to high performance computing, it also now can be um, enabled for the other end, which is functional safety, safety critical. Um, with that, I'm just going to summarize a little bit more. Um, there is a way to get involved with the with SICL. There's uh, many websites. It's all it's pretty much all open. The only thing you have to pay for is if you become part of the SICL safety or SICL safety code of a working group itself. Everything outside of that little blue bubble is free. Okay, including an advisory panel as well as various GitHubs and such. And with that, I think I'm going to stop here. And we have about five minutes for questions. Thank you very much. And my colleagues are going to probably feel most of the questions. <laughs> I
I hate stopping. I hate being, you know, holding people up from their dinner. So that's <laughs> the longer more you ask questions, the more you're holding up, <laughs> holding up dinner. <laughs> I'd like to get a little more insight on the non-deterministic issue when it comes to exceptions, uh, but also let's eliminate the part about the fact that they uh, dynamically uh, allocate memory. Is there anything else beyond that that's problematic? Okay, so I think the question is you're asking is about the non-determinacy of dynamic memory allocation. No, specifically exceptions, so specifically exceptions. excluding dynamic memory allocation. Excluding, yeah. Is it possible to do exceptions excluding dynamic memory allocations? Well, is there any sort of, like, is the non-determinism purely because of the fact that it uses uh, dynamic memory allocation? Or if you were to fix that problem, uh, would that non-determinism go away? Okay. okay. So exceptions uh, also use RTTI, which is another source of non-determinism. So it's those two together that is a problem. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, I, you know, I've done a deep dive into it. The big, the big thing is the unwind, the, the uncertainty of the unwind jump, which can go across many functions. And quite a few things in there, and as you pointed out in the SG14 talk, um, it, 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 it turns out that there are a couple of papers that is, so I'm interested in your results, the, the Herb exception results, as well as a paper that talks about um, the idea of statically, allo statically allocated um, exceptions. Um, and the whole idea is nothing in the standard actually says you have to do um, exceptions using the heap. It doesn't actually say that. Yeah, and, and, and back a long time ago with MetroWorks, um, Howard Hinnant, and what, he, what they were doing MetroWorks, he, he told me, um, they kept the exception on the, on the stack frame where it got allocated and just cleaned it up to the very, very end. So you don't need dynamic memory for that. You know, there are strategies, but the rest of it still is not determinative. Mm -hmm. Just had a conversation with Pablo about that, but we could talk about that later. Yeah, it's a fun conversation, and I want to have it with many of you guys because I I've been thinking about it a lot. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, very quickly, um, you talked about how um, for like runtime memory, you need to avoid dynamic memory allocation. Are you likely going to have to change the way that sickle events work? Because from what I understand, the way they're specified, they require the runtime to maintain memory for each event. Yes, that is definitely one of the problems. So um, as you, um, every submit call could or returns an event and the event is allocated by the runtime. So yes, that is something we're going to have to address somehow. And, and for other, for performance reasons, we've been uh, trying to find way other APIs that we don't have to return an event, especially when we don't need one. All right. All right. Any other questions? Good. No questions. That means we can go to dinner. Thank you, you very much. You all owe us two minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much.